Hello, and welcome to the excerpt. I'm Dana Taylor. With the advent of CRISPR as a gene editing technology, there are new opportunities to develop breakthrough treatments that weren't possible before. Could this be a turning point that revolutionizes how doctors treat some of the biggest medical challenges while also being a more effective and cheaper solution for the patient. Here to tell us about his work in genome editing and how it could shape the future of medicine is Shindar Sai, associate member and principal investigator of the Department of Hematology at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Thanks for being on the excerpt, Shindar. Sure thing. It's great to be here. What is CRISPR and can you explain how it's being used in new ways to treat disease? CRISPR um, stands for uh, Clustered interspersed regularly spaced palindromic repeats. So CRISPR is a method for, I know it's a mouthful. Um, so CRISPR is a method for genome editing. It allows you to change the DNA in living cells. And one of the reasons why everyone's really excited about CRISPR technologies is the fact that it can be programmed with a short RNA molecule. So this is a short nucleic acid like DNA. And so it means that you could basically very rapidly edit new sites in the genome to treat disease. Well, typically therapies would need to happen outside the body. Gene editing inside the body or in vivo is now an achievable goal. Could you explain more about what this type of gene editing is? Yes, so typically um, we would edit cells ex vivo. So that means you basically isolate the patient's cells and then you manufacture them. Um, So this might be something like a hematopoietic stem cell or blood stem cell and then put them back into the patient. In in vivo genome editing therapies, the editor is the drug. And so you'd basically inject a genome editor into the blood using something like lipid nanoparticles. Um, So this would be something that um, is a component, for example, of the COVID vaccine. So everyone has gotten things like this before. Um, And you would edit cells inside the body rather than editing cells um, outside. How is this kind of gene editing impacting patients? Yeah, so the first CRISPR genome editing therapy has been approved. Uh, this is called uh, Exocell. It's a treatment um, by editing these blood stem cells uh, for treating sickle cell disease. And so it's pretty exciting that this first genomic medicine has been approved. It works by inducing fetal hemoglobin as a replacement for defective sickle beta globin as a treatment for this uh, genetic disorder. And then what are the risks that are involved in these kinds of therapies? I think one concern is the unintended off-target activity of these editors. So the potential that they might edit somewhere else in the genome. Uh, My group and others have developed a number of different methods for understanding the global activities of these editors. And so a lot is being done to um, try to ensure that these treatments are safe. Some are concerned that research into existing genome information is not diverse enough to help all types of people, different races, for instance. How is that being addressed and considered when moving forward with this technology? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, I think one of the important areas to think about is how individual genetic variation affects the genome-wide activity of these genome editors. So this is work that uh, my group and many others have been working on. I think we want to understand if you have a genetic variant that, for example, overlaps an off-target site, how does that impact the efficacy of that treatment? So we know that everyone has millions of different genetic variants. Um, This is what makes us different or unique as people. And so when we think about genome editing, it's possible that, you know, everyone's genome is a little bit different. How does that affect or alter the global genome editing activity. And then I want to talk about what you do, the kind of work that you're doing at St. Jude to develop biomedical research and therapeutic applications. So my work at St. Jude focuses on advancing genome editing technologies um, and therapies. We work in three main areas. One is understanding the safety or global activity of these editors. Another is protein engineering to engineer improved versions of genome editors. And the third is translational applications in trying to bring these therapies to patients for conditions like sickle cell disease and bone marrow failure disorders. We've recently been working on a pretty exciting Blue Sky project here at St. Jude, also called Paradigm, focused on um, bringing 
genome editing to uh, individualized patient therapy. So trying to correct these patients' specific disease-specific mutations. Now, I did want to specifically ask you about the goals of that paradigm program. Yeah, so I think that we and many others have been really excited about genome editing therapies. Um, and I think one aspect is the idea that these CRISPR enzymes can be very easily um, programmed to target new sites and in principle correct patient-specific mutations. I think one of the challenges is um, advancing these in a personalized way. I think that you know we've all been very excited about, for example, the CRISPR therapeutics um, therapy, but that's for one common genetic mutation. And so how can we get to a future where hit? we have routine personalized genome editing therapies? And so that's, I think, the real goal of this project, um, to bring these types of genetic medicines to patients at St. Jude. How are AI and machine learning being incorporated into this technology? Yeah, so I think one of the aspects is that we want to basically very quickly predict um, the safety and efficacy of genome editing um, across many different targets. I think one idea is if you can understand the global activities of these editors, if you can generate large-scale data, that you might be able to train machine learning predictors to accurately predict how safe and effective a genome editor might be. Um, and so that's one of the goals of this paradigm project as well. Are there other applications for CRISPR and genetic engineering beyond just medicinal uses that could be impactful to society? And are there some concerning areas like potentially creating a market for designer babies? Yeah, I think um, the concern about designer babies, um, definitely a concern. I think, as um, you know, I think scientists came together and um, advocated for a global moratorium. And so I want to be very clear that the genome editing that we're talking about for therapies here is um, in the context of somatic cells. And so everyone that is serious about this effort is very careful about making sure that there's no unintended um, germline editing or the creation of you know, so-called designer babies. So this is an issue that's important, but um, important to clarify that that's not related to the therapies that we're discussing here. I'm going to ask you to take us into the future a little bit. What does a timeline for using this technology really look like? Well, I think you know CRISPR genome ed editors are here as therapeutics right now. Um, I'm also co-chair of a NIH Somatics of Genome Editing Consortium that's really focused on advancing this towards in vivo genome editing. I see many different clinical trials happening right now and many more happening over the next several years. So I think that there's going to be um, a massive growth in the number of these therapies that we'll see over the next several years. Well, and finally, and I'm just going to pin you down on this, what excites you the most about the future of this technology? I think the possibility that um, you could take a person's disease-causing mutation and correct it back to its natural state um, and really have an impact on patients. Um, I think that's a really amazing possibility for the future. It's fascinating information. Thank you so much for joining us, Shindar. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. I'm Dana Taylor. I'll see you next time.